We apologise for the poor quality during part of this sermon by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones from Romans chapter 6, verse 17 in the Spiritual Depression series. The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Romans in the 6th chapter and the 17th verse. The 17th verse of the 6th chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. But God be thanked that though ye were the servants of sin, ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. That is the statement as it's to be found in this authorized version which I have here before me. In other translations, uh, you will find that instead of form of doctrine, you have standard of teaching. But obviously, as we shall see, that means the same thing. Now, I'm calling your attention to this verse this morning because I want by means of it and through it to consider uh, once more this condition which we've been looking at for a few Sunday mornings which we've described as spiritual depression. Or if you prefer it, we are still considering the case of uh, what unfortunately must be described as the miserable Christian. Now I've been reminding you that these uh, terms and descriptions are in a sense contradictory. They are contradictions in terms. But nevertheless, we do all recognize that there is such a person, that there is this kind of experience to be had. Spiritual depression, or spiritual people in a state of depression. People who are Christians, and yet who are not experiencing the joy of salvation, and who indeed can quite accurately be described at times as miserable, though they are Christians. Now, we are approaching this whole subject, and say, hitherto we've been looking at it in a general way. We've taken a general view of the whole position. We've looked at a psalmist turning to himself and saying, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? And the general treatment he gave to himself in that condition. And then we've been looking at further specific causes. If a man isn't clear about justification by faith, he can never be a truly happy Christian. And any peace he may happen to enjoy is a false peace. And then last Sunday morning we considered the kind of person uh, depicted in that uh, incident in the life of our Lord. You remember where he healed the men and uh, the men passed through certain stages. He reached a stage in which he saw men as trees walking. He could see and yet he couldn't see. You couldn't call him blind, and yet you couldn't say that he could see properly. And we considered that as a description of numbers of Christian people who seem to have grasped a certain amount of truth, and yet, on the other hand, seem to be so uncertain that you're, you are not happy about them, and they're not happy about themselves. Well, now then, we can continue, I say, our consideration of this subject. And as we go on, we must be impressed by the fact that uh, the forms which this particular condition takes seem uh, to be almost endless. Uh, they come in different appearances and with different guises. And some people are stumbled at that very fact alone. They are amazed that there can be uh, so many symptoms or manifestations of this one disease, this spiritual condition. And, of course, that very ignorance of this problem in and of itself is a cause of the very condition that we are considering. The kind of person who thinks that uh, once you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, all your problems are left behind you, and the rest of the story is, and they all lived happily ever afterwards, is certain, sooner or later, uh, to suffer from this condition of spiritual depression. Because the Bible uh, teaches us to... Um, understand that there are many causes of this condition. And uh, it doesn't uh, hesitate to tell us the main central cause of it all. And that is, of course, Satan. We are brought into this marvelous life, into this spiritual condition. Yes, but over and against us is another kingdom. 
We are citizens of the kingdom of God. But the Bible tells us that we are opposed by another kingdom, which is also a spiritual kingdom. And that all along we are being attacked and besieged. It's the fight of faith. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And while that is so, we must be prepared for this condition that we are considering together, and we must be prepared for it in all types and kinds of shapes and forms. Because there is nothing that so characterizes all the activities of Satan so much as his subtlety. He is not only able and powerful, he is subtle. Indeed, the Apostle Paul tells us that he can transform himself into an angel of light if necessary. In other words, he has but one object, and that is always to ruin and to destroy the work of God. And there is no work of God that he is more anxious to destroy than the work of God in grace through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, the moment we become Christian, we become the special objects of Satan's attention. That is why James says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when ye fall into diverse temptations, whether you take it as trials or as temptations, it doesn't matter. You count it all joy because it's a proof of your faith. The moment we become Christian, the devil is particularly concerned to get us down. And there is no more successful way in which he does so than to make us miserable or to make us suffer, uh, as I've often reminded you, Charles Lamb once put it, uh, from the mumps and measles of the soul. We are there as uh, marasmic children, not thriving, not growing, not developing, not manifesting health and vigor. And, of course, any Christian in that position he is more or less a denial of his own faith, and Satan is pleased. So he is particularly concerned to produce this condition in us. And that is why we are looking at it together. And the point I'm making this morning is that we must expect then the manifestations of this to be protean. There's no end almost to the forms in which this condition may afflict us and in which it may manifest itself in us. Now then, I'm calling your attention to another general cause of this condition this morning. It's the one which is described in this word, in this verse that we're looking at together. Now, this verse, of course, is a positive description of the Christian. But we use it in this way. The absence of conformity to this description which we have in this verse is one of the commonest causes of all of spiritual depression or of the miserable Christian. Here is the apostle's description of Christians. He says, you were the servants of sin. You were under the dominion of Satan. You were in bondage in the kingdom of darkness. That's where you were. But you're no longer there. He thanks God, God be thanked, he says, that though you were once like that, now, he says, you're not there. Why? Well, for this reason, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you or unto which you were delivered. It doesn't matter. Now, there is his description of the Christian. And you notice the point which he's concerned to emphasize is this, is the wholeness of the Christian life. The balance of the Christian life. It's a life in which one has obeyed, there's the will, from the heart, there is the emotion, the sensibility. What? Well, the form of doctrine which came to the mind and to the understanding. So, you see, in describing the Christian, the thing he's emphasizing is that there is a wholeness about his life. The whole man is involved, the mind and the heart and the will. Now then, we arrive at our theme in this way. There is no commoner cause of this uh, spiritual depression that we are considering than the failure to realize that the Christian life is a whole life and a balanced life. Lack of balance, imbalance, is one of the most fruitful causes 
of these troubles and discords and disquiets in the life of the Christian men. Once more, I have to indicate, as I did last Sunday morning, that the cause of this lack of balance, I fear, must often be laid to the charge of the preacher or the evangelist. Lopsided Christians are generally produced by uh, preachers uh, whose doctrine lacks balance or lacks rotundity or fullness. Uh, more and more, I think, as we go on in our consideration of this condition, we shall see how vitally important is the birth of the Christian. I sometimes think that someone should take this up as a matter of research uh, to uh, show the relationship between the subsequent course of Christians and the particular uh, means or method or way of their conversion. It will be very significant and very interesting. Uh, the children are like their parents very often. I mean by that that the converts uh, tend to take on certain characteristics of the ones who are used of God in their conversion. Not only that, the type and kind of meeting in which people come into the life uh, tends to influence more than we often realize the subsequent history of these converts. The way you are born, the place you are born, the one who was used at the birth. These things, I think we shall see, are more and more important. We saw something of it last Sunday. Well, certainly, it's very important in this respect, which we are considering this morning. And uh, thus it is, of course, that you get these uh, different uh, types of Christians showing certain characteristics, all very much the same, with a certain stamp upon them, then others different, and so on. And uh, to the extent that that is true of us, to the extent that we've got these peculiar characteristics associated with a particular type of ministry or of teaching, to that extent we are more likely to be victims of this lack of balance which ultimately will manifest itself in unhappiness and in misery. Now, the Apostle Paul, of course, takes this up because a, pr a practical problem arose. Now, he's writing to these Christians at Rome. We can't be sure whether he imagines this position in order to refute it or whether it really did obtain in Rome. We don't know. It may be that there were people in Rome who were actually saying, shall we then continue in sin that grace may abound? Or it may have been the case that the apostle in writing, having established his doctrine of justification by faith only, suddenly says to himself, well now then, there's a danger in just leaving it like that. Some people may say, very well then, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's been saying that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And there were people who said that. Whether they were in Rome or not, it doesn't matter. But there were many in the early church who did argue like that. As there are still many who tend to argue like that. They said, very well then, in the light of that doctrine, it doesn't matter what a man does. In a sense, the more he sins, the more grace will be glorified. Being that I'm a Christian, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm covered by grace, antinomians. Now, uh, what does the apostle say about this? Well, his answer to it, in effect, is just this. He says, you can only say a thing like that if you don't understand the teaching. If you understood the teachings of the apostle, you'd never draw a deduction like that. It would be impossible. He answers at once, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin, that's what I've been preaching, he says, live any longer therein? I've been preaching to you, says the apostle in my previous chapter, the union of the Christian with Christ, that as he was in Adam, he is in Christ. Therefore, if he's in Christ, he's died with him, he's risen with him, this is impossible. And it's only the man who hasn't really grasped the truth, who can ever speak like this or want to behave like that. In other words, his whole subject, in a sense, in this chapter is the importance of grasping the balance of truth. The importance of taking hold, hold of the whole gospel and of seeing that uh, if one sees it truly, it leads inevitably to certain consequences. Now, then, let me try and divide that up briefly this morning. There are certain principles therefore enunciated here, it seems to me. The first is this. 
that often spiritual depression or unhappiness in the Christian life is due to our failure to realize the greatness of the gospel. What I mean is this. He talks about the form of doctrine delivered to them. He refers to the standard of teaching. This great and marvelous and mighty gospel. Now, people are often unhappy in the Christian life because they've thought of Christianity, of the whole message of the gospel, in, in, in inadequate terms. Some people think it's merely a message about forgiveness. You ask them to tell you what Christianity is, and they'll tell you that it means that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, and they stop. That's all. They want forgiveness, they're unhappy about certain things in their past, and they've heard that God in Christ forgives them, they take it, and they stop. That's all, that's the whole of Christianity, forgiveness only. There are others who seem to think of it and to conceive of it as morality only. They're not very interested in the question of forgiveness. They hold a view of themselves in which they feel they've never needed forgiveness. But they do want a high moral ethic. And uh, they, they, they want to know some exalted way of life. They want to do good in this world. Christianity to them is just a, a moral ethical problem. That's all, nothing else. Well, you see, such people are bound sooner or later to be unhappy. Certain problems will arise in their lives which are outside the realm of strict morals and ethics. Unhappiness, perhaps, in some personal relationships. Someone's death or something like that. And your moral ethic doesn't help you at that point. Their hearts are suddenly bleeding and breaking, and really what they have believed as gospel doesn't help them at that point and in that situation. And they're unhappy when this blow comes because they've never had an adequate view of the gospel. It's been a partial view. They've simply seen one aspect of it. And there are others who are interested in it. I don't want to keep you with these things. They're simply as something nice and beautiful. It makes a great aesthetic appeal to them. They say it's very beautiful. That's always their way of describing the gospel. And they can't come into details, but uh, somehow or other the entire thing seems to them to be very beautiful and very wonderful, and they feel better whenever they've considered it. Now then, I'm putting all those incomplete and partial views over against what the Apostle here refers to as the form of doctrine, the standard of teaching, the great truth which he elaborates in this very epistle to the Romans. These mighty arguments and propositions, these flights of divine imagination, that's the gospel. Or these, if I may borrow a phrase from Thomas Carlyle, these infinities and immensities of the epistle to the Ephesians and the epistle to the Colossians. That's the gospel. Now, I, I know we must have a, a correct view of these things. Somebody says, ah, oh, but you, when you're evangelizing, you don't take the epistle to the Ephesians or the epistle to the Colossians. You just tell people about forgiveness of sins. I know, in a sense, that's right, but in a sense, it's wrong. I had a letter from a friend who attended here a few weeks ago. I've never had the pleasure of meeting him. But he said a very significant thing. I'm not interested in and not concerned about what he actually said about me. But I've got to tell you what he said, and it includes me, in order to bring out my point. It was this. He'd been here on a Sunday night, and he said he'd made a discovery. And the discovery he said he'd made was this. That in a service which was obviously primarily evangelistic... There was something for believers. He said, I never understood that that could happen. He said, I never knew that that was possible. That in the one and the same service, an evangelistic meeting could be, a message could be preached to unbelievers, and yet it would have a message for believers which would disturb them. Now that man was making a great confession. You see, he was telling me what his view had been hitherto of the evangel. It was this partial incomplete one. Just selecting out one or two things. My friends, the way to evangelize is to give the whole counsel of God. But people say, you know, we haven't time for these things these days. We are so busy and so on. Let me remind you that the Apostle Paul, this mighty man of God, with this tremendous doctrine, preached that sort of thing to slaves in the first century. Not many mighty, not many noble are called, but that's what he gave them. 
These great arguments of the epistles, this tremendous presentation of truth. The gospel isn't a partial thing. He takes in the whole of men, the whole of life, the whole of history, the whole of world. He tells you about creation. He tells you about the final judgment and everything in between. It's a complete, a whole view of life. And I'm saying this morning that many are unhappy in the Christian life because they've never realized that. They've never realized that it is a way of life. That it caters for the whole of a man's life and covers every eventuality in his experience. That there is no aspect or phase of his life and of his activity, but that the gospel has something to say about it. The whole of life must come under it because it's all inclusive. The gospel is meant to control and to govern everything in our life. And if we don't realize that, we are certain sooner or later to find ourselves in an unhappy condition. So many, uh, because they indulge in these uh, harmful and unreal and unscriptural dichotomies, and only apply their Christianity to certain aspects of their life, then, then they're bound to be in trouble. It's quite inevitable. Very well, that's the first thing that we see here. We must realize the greatness of the gospel. Its vast eternal span. We must dwell more, I say, in the riches and in the richness of these great doctrinal epistles. That's the place we are meant to go on to. We are not always to be staying in the gospels, as it were. We start there, but we go on. And there, as we see it all worked out and put into its great context, we realize what a mighty thing it is and that the whole of our life is meant to be governed by it. But that brings me to my second point. Which, in the same way as we often fail to realize the greatness and the wholeness of the message, we fail to realize that the whole man must likewise be involved in it and by it. Ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine delivered unto you. Now man is a wonderful creature. He is mind and he is heart and he is will. And these are three vital and essential parts of us. Whether we like it or not, it's a fact. Those are the three main characteristics of man. God has given him this mind. He's given him a heart to feel. He's given him a will whereby he can act. Now, the, one of the greatest glories of the gospel, I always think, is this, is that it takes up the whole man. And I go so far as to assert that there is nothing else that does that. It is only this complete gospel, this complete view of life and death and eternity and everything, that is big enough to include the whole and the entire man. And again, it is because we fail to realize that, that many of our troubles arise. We are partial in our response to this great gospel. Let me just suggest uh, to some details to you to substantiate my point. There are some people in whose case the head only seems to be engaged. The intellect, the understanding. They, uh, they, uh, they tell us that they're tremendously interested in the gospel as a point of view. As a Christian philosophy. These are the people who are always talking about the Christian outlook or the Christian attitude. Or uh, perhaps the jargon of today would say the Christian insights. Uh, it's something purely philosophical, something entirely intellectual. Now I think you'll agree that there are large numbers of people in that position at the present time. Uh, Christianity to them is just that. It's, it's, it's a matter of tremendous interest. They say now, if only this Christian point of view, this Christian attitude could be applied, and they want to apply it in, in politics and in industry and in every other realm, all our problems would be solved. It's primarily this intellectual attitude and point of view. Or there are others, not so many today perhaps, but it was once very common, uh, whose uh, sole interest in um, the gospel was their interest in theology and in doctrine in metaphysics, and in the great problems and the arguments and the discussions. 
I speak nostalgically of those days, but they've gone. Not that I want to defend them, but how infinitely preferable they are to the present condition. But there were people whose only interest really in the gospel was interest in theological problems. And they argued and debated and discussed them. Their minds were very much engaged. This was their intellectual hobby, their intellectual interest. But the tragedy was that it stopped at the intellect. Their heads were packed full of theology. But their hearts had never been touched. Not only was there an absence of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ there, but there was sometimes even an absence of the ordinary milk of human kindness. These men would argue and debate and almost fight about particular doctrines, but were hard, couldn't be approached. You'd never go to them if you were in trouble. You felt they wouldn't understand, they wouldn't be able to sympathize, and still worse. It wasn't at all applied in their lives. It was something which they kept for their studies or for their leisure. And there they were, they were immersed in it. It seemed to be life to them. But it never entered into their wills. It didn't touch their practice, their conduct, or their behavior at all. Something entirely in the mind. Well, obviously, such a person is bound sooner or later to get into difficulties and to become unhappy. Have you ever seen a man like that facing the end of his life? Have you seen him when he can't read or when he's on his deathbed? I've seen one or two. I don't want to see another. It's a terrible thing. When a man reaches that point when he needs this thing most of all, it doesn't help him because it's never been applied anywhere. It's never moved him. It's never really gripped him. It was an intellectual hobby. The mind only. But then there are others in whose case the gospel seems to affect the heart only. This is commoner today. These are the people to whom Christianity is some vague sort of feeling. They've had an emotional release. They've passed through an emotional crisis. Now, I don't want to disparage this, but I'm here to show the danger of having that only. These are the people who had some problem in their lives. They may have committed a particular sin, and that's haunted them and dogged their lives. They've tried to forget it, tried to get it, but it follows them, and they can't get away from it. And at last they hear a message which seems to give deliverance from that, and they accept it, and all is well, and they stop at that. They wanted that emotional, psychological release, and they've had it. Because it can be had in various ways. It can be had from a partial gospel. It can be had from psychology using scriptural and even Christian terms without a gospel at all. You can have an emotional release, an emotional crisis, an emotional experience apart from truth. And these people, because they desired that primarily, have had that and nothing else. Or it may be that they were naturally interested in mysticism and in mystical phenomena. Some people are born natural mystics. There's something rather unworldly and unearthly about them. And they're interested in the mystical. Oh, there's a great interest in this at the present time, as you know. This psi phenomenon. These extrasensory experiences. There's a great deal of interest in all this at the present time. Well, there have been people who have always been interested in that. They're natural mystics, and they're always drawn by something which seems to be offering a mystical experience. And, of course, there's a great deal of that in the Scriptures. And they come to the Scripture because they feel, here I am going to find the satisfaction to this longing and desire of mine for this mystical experience. And they seek that, they get that, and they get nothing but that. Or it may be the case that people are in this position because they are simply being moved, as I said, aesthetically by the very presentation of the gospel, by the very atmosphere of a church, painted windows, monuments, statutes, ceremonies, ritual, form, hymns, singing, music, all these things 
Now, they, they, they want a certain amount of relief. Life is hard and life is cruel and they're being battered by circumstances and they go to this building or wherever it is and somehow they find they're comforted and soothed and quietened and feel happier and they're content with that, that's all they wanted and they've had it and they've got nothing more. Something's happened emotionally. They feel better, they feel happier and away they go. But as certainly as they do, They'll find themselves in, themselves in a predicament and in a position of facing a problem when that won't help them. They'll have to face something and think it through. And they've never learned how to think things through. They've been content to live on their feelings. And of course, I regret I have to say it, but oftentimes people are in this position because they've just responded to an appeal in an evangelistic service without knowing why. I remember a number of ministers telling me how they worked once in the inquiry room of a, a famous evangelist who was once in this country, but who now is an old man. And they found this. They asked the people who came to the inquiry room as to why they'd come. And very often they got this reply, that the person didn't know. But they said, well, you've come to the inquiry room, why have you come? Well, they said, I've come because uh, the preacher told us to come. What had happened was this, that man had a marvelous and exceptional gift of telling a story. He could dramatize it, he could put all the emotion conceivable into it. He'd end his address with this amazing story, then the appeal. And people in a kind of trance almost walked down the aisle and went to the inquiry room. They didn't know why. They'd been moved. They'd been fascinated. But there seemed to be no conception of truth. There was no relationship at all to the form of doctrine delivered. Moved emotionally, and by nothing else, they'd arrived in the inquiry room. Now, my friends, it is quite inevitable that such people will find themselves in trouble. They'll be unhappy and they'll be miserable. They'll get depressed. The feeling will go or something, and they won't know where they are, whether they've ever had anything or not. These are the people who have something in their heart, but whose heads are not involved or engaged at all, and oftentimes, unfortunately, it doesn't affect the will either. They're content to go on enjoying the experience or enjoying the feeling and are not concerned about the application and the practice. And then finally you've got some, oh, in whose case the will only is involved. It is possible, you know, for people, and it's often happened, unfortunately, to persuade themselves into taking up Christianity. They solemnly decide by an effort of the will to take it up. They say, well, I, I believe that's a good life. I'm going in for that. They decide. I think we should abolish this word decision. I don't like it. It seems to me that uh, to talk about deciding for Christ is really a denial of my text this morning, as I'll show you in a minute. Again, you see, this can often happen as a response to an appeal. If a great bombardment is made upon the wills of men, there are certain wills that are going to yield and respond, and they'll decide because they've been told to decide, because they've been pressed to decide. You're asking for it. The truth hasn't so gripped them that they feel, well, I can do nothing else. No, no, the pressure has been brought on decision and the will. They must decide, and they do decide. But they don't always know why they've decided. And later on, they'll begin to ask that question, or the devil will see to it that the question is raised in their minds, and they won't have an answer. Or oh, let me sum up this section by putting it like this. These are the people who decide to take up Christianity instead of being taken up by Christianity. That's my understanding of this text this morning. They've never known, I say, this feeling of inevitability. This feeling with Luther, I can no other, so help me God. I must. Everything else has been exploded. The truth has so come to me, I must. That's what Paul is really saying in this chapter. God forbid, he says, what are you talking about? Don't you realize what the truth is? How can you say, let us continue in sin that grace may abound? It means you don't know what grace is. It's only people who haven't understood the truth, who can even desire that, leave alone, do it. The tragedy of the antinomian is this, that he thinks he sees the truth clearly. The real trouble with him is that he's never seen it. 
Well, now then, I say that this is the cause of the condition. And let me emphasize this. Sometimes you'll find people who've got one of these only. Head only. Heart only. Will only. I think we agree that that must be wrong. Yes, but let's be clear about this. It is equally wrong to have any two only. It is equally wrong to have the head and the heart only, without the will, or the head and the will without the heart, or the heart and the will without the head. That's the thing I think the apostle, the apostle is impressing upon us. The Christian position is the three. And the three together. And the three at the same time. And the three always. A great gospel like this takes up the whole man. And if the whole man isn't taken up, think again, my friend, as to where you are. He have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine delivered unto you. What a gospel. What a glorious message. Can satisfy a man's mind completely. Occupy and move his heart entirely. And lead to a complete action in the realm of will. That's the gospel. Christ has died that we might be complete men. Not that parts of us might be saved. Not that we might be lopsided and imbalanced. But that there might be a proportion and a balance and a finality about it. But not only that, I say, if we lack this proportion, sooner or later we shall be in trouble. Because man, man has been made by God in this balanced way. Have you ever thought of it? It's an interesting problem in psychology. How God has put these three powers within us, the mind and the heart and the will, and what tremendous powers they are. You would have thought it would be impossible for the three to dwell in the same person, but God made man perfect. And before he fell, the three were in a perfect condition of balance. You see them perfectly in the Lord Jesus Christ. And salvation wants to bring us to that, to be conformed to his image, so that we are balanced people. And the effects and traces of the fall and of sin are removed and are destroyed. Finally, let me say just a word about this. This indicates, doesn't it, this lack of balance uh, fails to realize also that these three must always come in the right order. There is a definite order about these things, my friends, and the order is obviously this. Here were people who were the servants and the slaves of sin. They're no longer that. Well, why not? What's happened to them? Well, what the apostle says is this. The form of doctrine came to them. You have obeyed from the heart the form of sound doctrine delivered unto you. There they were in slavery. What's brought them out of it? A doctrine has come to them. A truth has been presented to them. They were not simply exhorted to come from there to here. It wasn't a mere appeal from the will. No, no, truth was presented. Oh, I say we must always put these things in the right order. And it's truth first. It's doctrine first. It's the standard of teaching first. It's the message of the gospel first. We are not simply concerned to move people emotionally or even in the realm of the will. We are concerned to preach the truth to them, preach the word. That's the message. The apostles were not sent out simply to have results and to change people. They were sent to preach the gospel, to preach the truth, to preach Christ, to declare Jesus and the resurrection. It's a message. It's a form of doctrine. It's the deposit. These are the terms. And the church is asking for these spiritual monstrosities when she fails to put that first. She may swell her ranks, but she leave great problems for the spiritual physicians. A Christian is a man who knows why he is what he is. A Christian is not a man who says, well, something marvelous happened to me. I've had a vague feeling. Not at all. He is a, to be ever ready, says Peter, to give a reason for the hope that is in him. And if he can't, he'd better make sure again that he's a Christian. The Christian knows why he is where he is. He knows why he is what he is. He's had a doctrine. He's received a truth. This form of sound teaching has come to him. It came to his mind, and it must ever start with his mind. Truth comes to the mind and to the understanding, enlightened by the Holy Spirit. 
And then, do you see, having seen the truth, he loves it. It moves his heart. The truth comes to him and he sees what he was. He sees the life he was living and he hates it. He that loves the Lord hate evil, says the psalmist. Quite right, you can't help it. If you really see the truth about yourself as a slave of sin and the ugliness and the foulness of the life of sin, you'll hate it. Then you see this glorious truth, this purity, this holiness, this life of Christ, and you say, I want it, I desire it. Your heart's engaged. Truly to see the truth means that you're moved by it and you love it. You can't help that. If you see the truth truly, I say you must feel its power. And that in turn leads to this. That your greatest desire, of course, will be to practice it and to live it. That's Paul's whole argument in this chapter. He says this is unthinkable. If you only realized your unity with Christ, that you've been planted together in the likeness of his death, that you've been buried with him and, and also therefore risen again with him, you can't be joined to Christ and one with him and say, shall we continue in sin? Does this give me license to go on doing those things which formerly used to frighten me? Of course, says Paul, it's inconceivable. You've not seen it. If you've only seen it, you'll love it and you'll want to live it. And so he proceeds with his mighty argument and demonstration. From which then I draw this final conclusion. That in, these, in this realm, we must always realize in our own cases and when we are talking to others, that the heart is never to be approached directly. I go further, the will is never to be approached directly either. To me, this is a very great principle in personal dealings, in preaching everywhere. The heart is always to be influenced by the understanding. Truth. Then the heart, then the will. We have no right to make a direct attack upon the heart in ourselves or anybody else. I've known many people do this to their own damnation, I fear. I've known certain men who lived a wrong life and they went to places of worship and they forced themselves to cry and because they wept in the service when they sang a hymn or listened to a sermon they said, ah, I'm all right after all. They deliberately produced the emotion because they knew it would give them a sense of satisfaction. They say, I can't be all wrong or I couldn't respond like this but they produced the response themselves. Had they responded to the truth they'd have changed their lives. We must never approach the heart or the will directly. They must be approached via the truth that comes to the greatest gift of God to men, the mind and the understanding. God made man in his own image, and there is no question, but that the greatest part of that image is this mind, this ability to comprehend truth. And God has endowed us with that. And God sends truth to us in that way. But God forbid, I say again, that anybody should therefore think it's only intellectual. No, no. It starts there, but it goes on and moves the heart. And the man yields and acts with his will. He obeys. Not grudgingly or unwillingly, but with a whole heart. This glorious, perfect truth that has so persuaded his mind and has captivated his heart. Oh, may God make of us balanced Christians, men and women of whom it can be said that we are evidently, obviously, patently obeying from the heart the form of doctrine. This concludes this sermon in the Spiritual Depression series by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones.